welcome to today so today we have an extremely distinguished uh, speaker with us uh, we'll chat about many things during the course of our discussion he is dr uh, bhukti vasudev swami in his another avatar he is known as his holiness bhukti vasudev swami um, who is associated with iscon which is international society for krishna consciousness he is an extremely extremely erudite and scholastic person who teaches at minneapolis uh, in the united states he goes around the world talking about various topical and very very interesting issues facing the world at large um, so we are extremely proud to have him amid us today welcome to the show a pleasure uh, since he can talk about many things and most of the things under the sun i mean <laughs> so we can will i'm sure we'll have a very informal at the same time very insightful discussion um, to start with we know many of the countries particularly in the third world and in the developing world as well like countries like india bangladesh pakistan they are often faced with this the issue of financial fraud corruption etc and one of the topics that you delve at large with is uh, sonic therapeutic intervention for curbing financial frauds so may i start with asking you what is this sonic therapeutic <laughs> intervention all about is <laughs> that uh, thank you this is a very insightful uh, uh question <coughs> because as a management scientist um i conduct research and this very research was uh, focused on how transcendental sound vibrations can transform the individual in such a way that they become transcendental to the impulse of fraud fraud intentions fraud manipulations etc so here is the deal uh, i come to the research and the basic for, uh, the format of the research was such that you no know, in research we have uh, methodologies like quantitative qualitative and mixed methods so this very research i utilize a qualitative uh, method and it was basically all about how the the chanting or the repetitions of the names of krishna rama and hari how they impact on the individual and the results are great so i went around interviewing people who had been involved in this process the process of bhakti yoga for some of them have been involved in the process for two decades three decades and they are mainly uh people who are of high profile status a number of them are phd's they be practicing a number of them have masters i think the least uh, participant was a uh, 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 first degree holder so these are people who have who are involved in practice of bhakti yoga or uh, krishna consciousness for decades and uh, when i uh, i conducted this interview my research yeah. uh focus was on how the mantra how the hari krishna hari krishna 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 hari 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 rama hari rama 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 hari hari how it has impact on their impulses for instance the desire to accumulate wealth overnight and even to take the risk of stealing from your company and it happens because i know cases even when i was in africa i know of cases where people are uh, like uh, uh chief financial officers of a company or general managers of a company and <laughs> <laughs> they still they, they still so much money from the company and before they, before the director knows they've gone <laughs> so what i found in this research was that the chanting enabled one 
post-conventional consciousness. Post-conventional consciousness is a platform or an awareness where you are on a particular level of awareness that you know this is not good, it's not good for the community, it's not good for me, it's a crime or it's an antisocial behavior and you don't need anyone to tell you. You just completely ignore it. If even the opportunity is there for you to violate it, you completely ignore it. In other words, the assumption is like you're so much aware of your environment, of the fact aware of yourself of the fact that you know someone is watching you and not only that you are aware that this is not good it's not for the benefit of everyone involved it's not for the benefit of the company and you are treating the resources of the company as if it is your personal assets you cannot steal it from your own assets boy you cannot steal <laughs> so this is a high level uh, consciousness where you are dealing with the money. I say you're the uh, chief financial officer or the accountant or whatever. And the frauds mainly take place in the accounting section, you know. So, but then, so in, so in, in this case, I found that a number of these people who are also working in the finance industry, they had opportunity to defraud their organizations. But they did not. And that level of consciousness, basically, we, <coughs> we target to be post-conventional consciousness. Because you don't have any, and if, in fact, if people come to that level, there will be no policing system. But unfortunately, uh, strategies to bring people to that level is very rare. And by the way, the essence of their involvement in the Krishna consciousness or the, in the chanting of the Hare Krishna <coughs> movement was not just to become, uh, to get to that platform of post-conventional consciousness of not being attracted to stealing or not being, uh, being attracted to uh, of crime or defrauding their firm. The idea was, they had this in, the, the, the whole purpose of, the, of their involvement was to come to a platform where they can really have divine love for Krishna. In fact, the purpose of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra chanting is to attain pure love for Krishna. Krishna Prema Puma to Mahal. And this other thing of being free from the propensity to cheat, to steal, to defraud, these are just side effects. Just like any intervention in the secular world, allopathic medications, they have their side effects. They give you some uh, good, uh, good deal, do good comfort, healing, or you know, recuperation, uh, encouragements. But also they have side effects. I can give an example: chemotherapy. You know, people who have cancer, they only, in most cases they undergo chemotherapy. But chemotherapy has terrible side effects. So my point is, whether it is an allopathic therapy or it is an Ayurvedic therapy, uh, we do have some side effects. And in this case, this intervention, this uh, Hare Krishna mantra intervention, the side effects are amazing. So this is one of the side effects that post-conventional consciousness, the person is not interested in stealing. He sees the assets as if it's his own and is there to protect them without anyone even worrying about what transpires or someone thinking negatively about it. No, it, it wasn't there. And then the other thing, the other thing that came up in the research was that the people who were chanting for so many years, they have that type of uh, awareness of the fact that they are different from this body. Because traditionally we think that we are the bodies so we see somebody and we evaluate them based on their physical features. But then there's people who have been chanting for years based on this uh, research. They are at a platform where they recognize that you know each and everybody has their physical body, but they also have their self, the spirit self or the spirit soul. 
And so they don't just identify people based on their bodies. And that is amazing because in the West, you know, every one of us, or majority of us, have that conception that, you know, I'm this body and whatever, the, whatever it takes to satisfy the body, you go ahead and do it. And this has created a lot of problems for mostly uh, a number of leaders in the Western countries. I know that this is, is uh, I mean, the similar problem is, is all, it's all pervasive. It go, I mean, it, everywhere in the whole world, leaders have this tendency to, uh, to abuse a position based on misconception that they are these bodies. In other words, they, these chanters, they transcended that level of identity crisis. Identity crisis is a big thing. Because once we misidentify with the body, our thought pattern is completely different. Uh, we take advantage of situations, our base, we wire situations, our brain has become, become so wired that everything we experience or we encounter, we, we try to evaluate it how it's going to suit my purpose in terms of my gratification. So the people, these participants of this very research, they had this high understanding, high conception, high realization beyond the physical body. Then I was, you know, they were completely, uh, tra uh, they, they transcended the identity crisis. They were able to overcome that. And then they also had these uh, spiritual so which, values. Which means uh, these people are empirical evidences to prove yeah, yeah. that All people right. who regularly chant their, 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 their life is less totally prone to, yeah. 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 to exploitation. exploitation. <laughs> and the other thing is it's more of preemptive in nature than preventive because, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. because it changes one from inside. Yeah, from inside. You see, you can make so many laws, okay? Uh, in America, you know, see, if you, you're driving on the, uh, on the highway and someone even makes a little mistake, maybe they didn't honk before they, they cross or they didn't put on the light, uh, the traffic light before they uh, over, overtake you, you can call the police and in three minutes the police are there to arrest the person. Three minutes. <laughs> But people still commit offenses. People still commit road traffic crimes. Uh, they violate road traffic addicts. People still break into homes to steal and all these things. The police, they're there. You just call the police and they're arrested. So, yeah, making laws is good to self guide people, but making laws along with our transformation of individuals can, you know, cannot really solve the whole problem of prevention of crimes. Which means uh, the deterrents are not as effective as these preemptive yeah. therapeutic interventions. Yeah. Deterrent, you know, I've seen cases when I was young, you know, I used to sneak out from my father's home. We were living in the city, a metropolitan city, and I used to sneak out when I was like a third grader, fourth grader. I used to sneak out from the home to go to, go to the stadium. Okay? <laughs> and I remember one time we went to the stadium to watch public execution. And so, when this, they were executed for robbery, the, the law in the country at that time, and that was in, in Africa, the law in, the, in that country at that time, they were, it's being ruled by the military. And so, they had these draconian laws that if you are involved in drug, you could be executed, or you commit armed robbery, you could be executed. So we went to watch. I was curious to see when people are being killed. So I went there with uh, two of my uh, cousins. Uh, you know, children, we, we get to the stage of exploration. <laughs> so we went to the stadium and we watch it. We watch the execution. People are being executed for robbery. Okay. So after the execution, we are going out from the stadium. Right at the gate, at the gate of the stadium, people have seen how. The result, the consequences of stealing, being executed. But right at the gate of the stadium, police we are police caught people picking pocket, stealing. So, you know, you know, in a Vedic language we have this concept, Pashana Pina Pashati. You know, after even seeing, after hearing, it does not deter you from committing a crime. <laughs> you can still go on or Oh yeah, oh yeah. So this uh, uh, mantra meditation that the Hare Krishna uh, are involved in, and there's a lot of transformation that comes with that. And so, in my research, 
I found that this, the elements of post-conventional consciousness and uh, uh, transcendence, transcendence to uh, identity crisis and then uh, spiritual values and self-control. And these elements, when you conduct research, research in the literature, uh, you find that in management sciences, you find that self-control, for instance, is an antidote to crime. Because in the general theory of crime, uh, propounded by uh, two criminologists, and uh, they are Gottfriedson and Hitchie, in 1990, they developed this theory uh, called the general theory of crime. And the general theory of crime basically stipulates that all crimes and antisocial behavior are due to low self-control. In other words, due to people who lack self-control. And in this research, one of the uh, one of the elements of the results was that the people who are chanting this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, they develop high self-control. And so high self-control, post-conventional consciousness, and uh, transcendence to identity crisis, they are enablers of you know, uh, completely tra being transcendental to fraud. Front crime. And then they enable complete uh, anti-fraud prospects of life. And from there, we draw the conclusion that, yes, you know, because these, the antidotes of, you know, uh, fraud or antidotes of crime are part of these results. And so this, uh, uh, this chanting uh, enabled uh, the... So is there any scientific basis of claiming that this is the particular mantra which you go on, uh, one goes on chanting and chanting, then there will be changes from within. Or it can be any other chance for believers of other religion, other spiritual practices and all that? Yeah. In the, in the, in the management science literature, there are a number, of, a number of researches that have been conducted regarding the use of uh, sound or mantra meditation in, for instance, promoting mental health or the use of mantra meditation in promoting willpower. People get into trouble because one, one reason, their will, willpower is very low. They have good intentions. I'm not, I, I like to do like this, but then the, the strong, the, the willpower is not there. In fact, 80% I was just I was just reading some some uh, study. Eighty percent of people. This was a study in America, uh, according to the uh, U.S. Uh, news. A study in America that was conducted. It shows how eighty percent of the participants failed to sustain their change initiative. They are the uh, during the New Year Eve. They took a vow, I'm not going to smoke again. But, like, a few weeks elapse, and then they fall back to the smoking. Now, this is due to very weak, strong will. Now, uh, one of the research on matter meditation shows how when people embark on this uh, meditation, uh, they help themselves in the sense that they are when before the meditation, they are right uh, prefrontal uh, pre uh, uh, cortex was measured, right dorsal uh, prefrontal cortex was measured, and after the meditation, that same uh, part of the brain was measured, and then we'll, they find that the part that part of the brain which is responsible for uh, willpower expanded. And so the scientists, they come to the conclusion that the meditation help people in developing strong willpower. Besides willpower, there are lots of research that have been conducted regarding the use of this bar mantra in uh, promoting mental health. For instance, burnout, anxiety, stress, depression, Con researchers have conducted, you know, different studies, and they came up with a conclusion how this very mantra helps in mitigating the challenges of mental health. So it's not that 
you know, I'm talking about this man. This is what mantra. This is the mantra I focus. But there are also other mantras that other scholars, some scholars, have conducted research, and they came up with similar results. How it helps chanting of especially Vedic mantras helps in promoting mental health because you find that people who are engaged in this type of uh, super, mund super mundane activities, they're very serene, they're very peaceful. If you go and poke them, they will not be reactive, rather they will be proactive. So it shows that their life is completely transformed. And so yes, uh, yeah, there, are other, there are other mantras that uh, are also very effective in transforming individuals. But in the age of Kali, in this 21st century, 21st century is part of the age of Kali. In the age of Kali, for the purpose of attaining God consciousness or Krishna consciousness, attaining Krishna, it is recommended. Lord Krishna himself recommended also in the Bhagavad Gita that of all sacrifices, he is Japa. And I was chanting softly his holy name for the individual's benefit. In the Puranas, it is also mentioned that in the Kali Yuga, in this present dispensation, uh, the process of attaining God consciousness is to chant His holy names. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, this is another higher level, but as researchers, okay? So, I'm a Swami, I'm a Guru, but I'm also a researcher, I'm a scholar, okay? So, I try to integrate both sides, and that gives me a lot, a lot of satisfaction, okay? <laughs> because I can explain the things based on scientific values. Yeah, another scientific value we practice based on this chanting, because the chanting, you could do it in the, uh, on your own individually. Is there any particular way that one has to change this, or yeah. any way one likes it? There are particular ways that, that, yield, that yields more, uh, more effective results, but anyone who ties, if even you play with a mantra, if even you use a mantra to mock, to mock somebody, say a priest, Okay, <laughs> you get some benefit. <laughs> but we don't advise people to, 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 to go on that route. But if even you playfully chant a mantra, you get some benefit. There is no loss or diminution in the process of chanting this mantra. Yes, but the best period to chant this mantra, if we want to attain that love of Godhead, because the love of Godhead gives us, uh, it, the love of Godhead, Basically, we want love in this world, but love, the love of God, that, uh, you know, is uh, integrating all of the, you know, all of the love that we're looking for in this world. And so, yes, there is a specific uh, way to do it. There is uh, also a set down period to do it it's within a time frame. If you do it within that time, then you can get higher results. Because, for instance, the day and night are governed by the three modes of nature. We have the mode of goodness, uh, the mode of passion, and the mode of ignorance. Now, the nights are basically uh, under the auspices of the mode of uh, ignorance. So, it's recommended by the uh, acharyas, recommended by the sages, that if we want to get the opt or optimum results, of chanting this Hare Krishna Mantra, we should do it during the Brahma Muhutra hours before sunrise. In fact, that time, everywhere, you have serenity of purpose and you can have a better focus. And uh, yeah, that's the best period. And besides that, you can chant anywhere. You can chant in the toilet, you can chant anywhere, you're bathing, you're diving in the, uh, in the Ganga, you can, anywhere, in the bedroom, you can chant anywhere. It's quite like in Bengali we say chole bole ko chole jekano bhabe aradh ke daklei tar kache pochon ba uni jeta ke attend karar kato bolchilen. So that tempts me to ask you another question. Uh, on one hand, all these spiritual gurus, yogis, they talk about meditation, which is done in total tranquility, total yeah. peace and silence. So one thing talks about silence, the other talks about therapeutic, sonic therapeutic, which involves sounds, yeah. audio. Yeah. So, uh, is there a contradiction or...? No, 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 there's no contradiction. There are different approaches to meditation. Because uh, apparently, noise, sound and <laughs> silence, <laughs> yeah. there they are, are opposite to it. Yeah, there are uh, different approaches to meditation. Just like 
you know, a number of scientists that were just speaking with one of the boys who accompanied me. He did his PhD in mathematics. And so they, he did a quantitative study with all diagrams here and there. So he, did, he, he was not aware that there are other processes of, you know, uh, research methodologies. So then I was explaining to him the different research methodologies because in management sciences, when we are doing, the, when I was doing the PhD, you, you take a phenomenon or a phenomena and you have to use a quantitative approach, a qualitative. You play, we play with research. So you go here in this way, you go quantitative, pure scientific. You go qualitative, that is some type of, you know, leaning. And then mixed methods. So in a similar way, in meditation, we have different approaches to meditation. The goal is to attain higher levels of consciousness. But there are, there are uh, prescribed methodologies that we, people use or we use, and one of them is mantra meditation. Mantra meditation involves recitation, recitation of transcendental sound vibrations. Now, there are some type of meditation that, you know, I've seen that a lot, especially in Western countries and also in India. People sit down and then, you know, they close their eyes and uh, they're thinking about something. But you see, the mind is, so, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is the irony of it. The mind is such that it's always engaged. So you can't say you want to remain silent. Some impulses will trigger, will trigger into your mind. And therefore, it is pertinent to mention that, yes, you can also do your meditation silently. For instance, you may do the chanting also silently from within, but it is recommended that you chant out because then you are able to hear it. It creates a better, effective value. The impact is higher. Yeah. And it resonates also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there is a particular way and there is a particular time as well, as you said, the Brahma Mood, uh -huh, uh -huh. uh, to chant this mantra. Sure. So uh, you can follow either doing meditation in total silence yeah. or doing chant. But uh, this chanting, has it got anything to do with the breathing, normal breathing? Has it, uh, uh, has it yeah. to be done with some breathing exercises as well? Yeah. See, see, what happens is that in previous ages, people do meditation. They go to the forest to embark on meditation. And then the first thing, it begins with physical exercises like breathing and all this type of stuff. Now, that helps. But, you know, the physical exercises are also uh, encapsulated in this chanting, first and the breathing process is also encapsulated in the chanting. Because when you are really involved in the chanting, your breathing system is not normal. So you're chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. You're not breathing like a normal person who is just doing some domestic job or official chores or whatever. So the breathing is also uh, uh, Affects it. It goes uh, with the rhythm. Uh -huh. Rhythm is different. Yeah. So, yeah, it changes the breathing pattern also, and that helps you in creating a better focus. Yeah, but then in the prior ages where people do step by step meditation, you have to see it in a particular way, you have to use a deer skin or, kusa, or use a kusa, sit on a kusa grant or whatever. Yeah, those exercises are there. But you see, because that systematic approach was when people were living for like thousands of years, and in the case of Subhari Muni, he, 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 he did uh, meditation for like over, over 50 years, 60 something thousand years. We can't live even up to 100 years. And so this, pres this method of meditation is given to us to expedite our process of attaining our ultimate goal, which is Krishna, pure, um, pure love for Krishna. So yeah, there are different, uh, different ways to do it, but essentially, in this very yoga, in this very, process, in this very Kali yoga, uh, it is not so demanding, and therefore we can chant anytime, anywhere, any place, but the best times are also prescribed.
the best pushers are also prescribed. So can this chanting be part of the normal breathing process as well? I mean, you don't have to do it very cautiously or deliberately, but it comes automatically and spontaneously. Yeah, it comes automatically and spontaneously. Uh, there are some little devil has a bit there in terms of focus. You chant him, you know, Papa, our founder of Charya, he emphasized that we should chant and listen to the sound that is coming out from our mouth. Because that helps you, the individual meditator, in creating a positive spiritual, spiritual, spiritual change. There are some preachers who say that there is a method which is popularly known as the Hamso method. Uh, once you inhale, you go on saying so, and once you exit, you say Hamso, or it could be other way around as well. <laughs> yeah. so, are these also uh, in some way effective? Or? These are any meditation, meditation that, uh, that involves transcendental names like Om, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. There are so many mantras in the Vedic culture, in the Vedic literature. They, are all, they all give you some results, but if you want to attain the uh, Madhuri Ras or be associated with Madhuri Ras, it is recommended because it's, this mantra is recommended because this mantra is having to do uh, or is, uh, is encompassing Krishna, Balaram, and Ram, and Radharani, an invocative form of Hare. And so, Radha and Krishna, they are one personality, but physically they are different, but one mind. Because when Krishna wants to have some rasa, he manifests, manifests Radha. So sometimes people have a misconstruction. They think, oh, why did Krishna have a girlfriend? Or why did Krishna have a wife? Or whatever. It's the same person. It's what we call in Western culture, you know, uh, father God and mother God. So the whole thing is such that these names, Hare, Krishna, Rama, they are the embodiment of these three personalities, Radha, Krishna, Rama. And so when we chant, we are actually creating a, 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 a viable future to have an ingress into Goloka. Because that is a resident of Krishna and Radha, Radha Krishna and Balra. So when we chant these names, we are actually preparing for our future. And especially in India, we are uh, you're, you people are so much blessed. Just to take bed in India, you know what that means? <laughs> if if Indians know what it takes to be born in India, they will be crazy after spirituality. Unfortunately, in some cases, you know, people have all of these assets, spiritual assets, but we're not able to take serious. Uh, uh, we know we're not able to take things seriously. But you know, the point is that yeah, these names are very powerful. And it, they have, these names have transformed so many people. They've changed, the names have changed hippies to happies, potheads to sadhus. Sadhus. So, what type of transformation you will find anywhere that will transmute potheads, drug addicts, to holy, holy men, holy women? In fact, a proper when he was in America, <laughs> Uh, the people you need to hear this. When he went, when the father of Is Isco went was in America preaching. So one of the places that was really very very uh, rare for sadhus to preach. You know, in America there are some places w what we refer to as nudist nudist homes. And it is environments or nudist uh, communities are such that men and women. They, are, they live there nude. So these are like artificial renunciants. They are tired of, they come from wealthy families, educated families, but then they are like renunciants. They renounce all, all of the wealth and then they go to Nidus homes. My brother even went to Nidus home and made devotees there. He preached to them and then some of them followed it. So this is the transformative effect of the Hare Krishna moment. It's just instant. 
It changed people's life. Look, I give you an example. My own case, I was not born in India, okay? But for the past 39 years, I've been involved in this process of chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Yeah, I could do something else with my life. I, mean, I have a PhD in management science with over 35 publications. I remember the other time when I was having an interview with uh, one platform, and then those two guys, they, they became so curious. They said, but how did you get here? <laughs> with all your skills how did you get here so yeah we do have what we call samskaras and so when you're born those past events that you've been involved in they come along with you and i remember my case i was just yearning for understanding indian philosophy right from third grade and then i started buying some indian books and started reading and my father was scared but there's nothing they could do. Where my son is heading. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, then he trusted me, okay? So, he just was praying that. You know. Allowed, eventually allowed you right. to <laughs> pursue whatever you want. To. Yeah, exactly. He was a very understanding guy. So, yeah, my point is, it's very transformative. The process is very transformative. What, what else can I, how, how else can I describe it? It's so transformative. It had changed, you know, a person like me, he was a militia, to what I am now today. So you, have, you hail from Nigeria, yeah, I was born settled in, Nigeria. In, in the oh, States. I was born in Nigeria. I joined the Hare Krishna movement in Nigeria. I bought two literatures from one devotee. At that time, I was a young man uh, working with the Department of Justice. And then I got, I met this devotee, so I bought some two books. and. I went to my home, I was living by myself, a different city from where my parents were living. So I read, well, the day I bought those books, I didn't sleep that night. I just used the, my time to read the whole books. And when I, when I finished reading those books, all of the questions that were bothering me since my childhood, I asked, I asked a lot of questions when I was a kid. But, you know, family members, they could not give me satisfactory answers. Teachers couldn't give me any answers. The pastors or priests in my church couldn't give me any answers. But I read those, I read those two books by Sri Prabhupada, and all the questions that were bugging me were answered. So I thought, this, I'm sure other people are suffering like me, lacking information, spiritual information. So let me join and help to spread this message to others. That was the motivation for me to join. So yes, I was born in Nigeria. So when I joined in Nigeria, then I got invited by some professors in America, political science professors, to come for their conference. And when I came to America, you know, some devotees uh, requested that I could stay in America to help with the preaching. So I stayed, and then that's how I became a US citizen. And I've been living in America for almost two decades, yeah. So from Nigeria to the States, and then now you move around all over the world yeah, yeah. preaching these things. So, yeah. so you have seen different societies, different uh -huh. countries, and different types of human beings yeah. in different parts of the world. Yeah. So how is it that the level of fraud, level of corruption is different from one part of the world to another? And fraud is a general, it's a general disease. As one may think that in America people are not involved in fraud. But my research was, was focused on America. Okay, we hear of third world countries, we have them in the news. Oh, this country, oh, that country, oh, that country. Traditionally, we don't hear about the West, West in the news for fraud. But is, there is also heavy fraud in Russia, in America, in, in England. So yeah, fraud is all pervasive. But the gradation is different. In some places, it's highly sophisticated. And, and billions of dollars. <laughs> intelligent <laughs> people do it in an intelligent manner. Yeah, in a sophisticated, sophisticated way. Manner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in developing countries, in most cases, is you know, it's very gross. I was reading in uh, in um, in Indian times how some uh, tourists were defrauded in Puri. 
through you know uh, hotel booking and all the rest of them. So the editor he was warning that you know people want to book hotels in, in India, they have to cross checks. The, the, the additional risk to be defrauded. So fraud is fraud is there everywhere. There are people, people, human beings. We are big brains. But sometimes we misdirect the utility of our big brains for higher purpose. I mean, for we misdirect our brains for you know lower purpose instead of higher purpose. But India, uh, in India, the spirituality or religious things being the lifeline of Indian society, and with so many gurus all around, wow. don't you think that uh, uh, going by your logic only that <laughs> these chantings and these prayers they change one from inside? Yeah. So level of fraud and uh, criminality or crime should have been much lower. Uh huh. But in for all practical purposes, it is not. Uh, I've not studied India in terms of the fraud to come mix some comparative analysis, but fraud is very rampant in India. Indians are most, or are in, in, in most cases, the most intelligent people on this planet. In America, we have all these Indians who are uh, surgeons who are placed in the high profile positions. IT, oh, they are all over. So Indians are very, very, very intelligent. And so when you're highly intelligent, and intelligence is not properly directed towards Krishna consciousness, this intelligence could be misled and used for criminal activities. Yeah. So yeah, in India also crime, crime is there, fraud is there. Uh, especially during the COVID, I was seeing in the newspapers, uh, fraud or here, fraud there. <laughs> so, bro, it's a general, it's a general, a general disease, you know. It's a, a general problem. <laughs> but there can be another logic also, which sometimes uh, cited by the fraudsters or maybe someone else, that if God is all pervasive, uh-huh. or you call it Krishna or whatever name you give it to, and everything happens for a purpose. Uh-huh. So even these frauds, they also happen for a purpose. Okay. And there can be a special <laughs> reason or purpose why they are happening. So uh, how can we actually define what is fraud and what is not? Okay. Yeah. There's a difference between what is fraud and what is not fraud. Fraud means we exercising our cheating propensity. Now, cheating propensity could also in, 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 term, in the financial industry. Now, cheating propensity could also be exercised in in married life, for instance. People cheat their spouses, and sometimes it results to divorce. Now, the fundamental principle there is that we have a tendency to cheat, and if the opportunity arises, some people they are not able to censor their mind and the urges of the senses and so they become victims of circumstance. They fall into it. And then in some cases they go to jail and all these things. Yes, so fraud is a general thing and yes, uh, people may say, I mean, like like some of me argue that, but if God is all powerful, why why is he allowing this? Why is he allowing this? Huh? He should have controlled me from committing the crime. Yeah, it's a good argument, but the, the counterpoint to that is that God loves us so much, Krishna loves us so much that if you love your child so much, you will not circumscribe your child. Unfortunately, I've seen some parents, even in India, I've seen some parents in India who circumscribe even their 35 years old sons. Yeah. So, if you love your child so very, very much, you give them a breathing space. So, Krishna gives us breathing space. He gives us, you know, hey, I love you so much. You have a free will, okay? <laughs> if you love me, if you love me, do the things voluntarily to please me. If you deviate, what can I do? I still have the free will. We do have a free will. So, some of us abuse the free will. We get involved in fraud. We get involved in crime. And some people, they are able to resist the temptation of fraud. So, so in either way, yes, God is there. He loves us. So he gives us the free will. We can abuse the free will. Or we can sustain that free will in a loving relationship with God. Yeah. It's like in a question paper, you have out of three, you can answer only one. <laughs> so you have yeah, three yeah, options. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can pick and choose only one. Yeah. 
the other thing we will get into different interesting topic in the next episode but just before concluding this one at the beginning of the discussion you mentioned that the trend the trend is good but not always it works the way these preemptive measures do yeah. but in one of our two great epics like ramayana there is a character called balmiki who was earlier a robber yeah so when he was in the process of getting transformed he was asked to chant this rama mantra for some reasons he were not being um, you know able to pronounce rama 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 so he was asked to do mora 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 which is dead but the uh, opposite way of pronouncing rama so you go on chanting mora 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 it actually <laughs> sounds like rama 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 no. so sometimes uh, actually this was a kind of deterrent uh-huh. he was a robber whatever sins he had to do he had already committed then this was one of the ways he can get himself transformed so yeah. sometimes deterrent can also work hmm. yeah uh, the case of but well, maybe that's a very striking example and there are also other cases where we find people who have been involved in criminal activities and they trying to become involved in devotion to to the god or to lord or to krishna and there was uh, uh, there was some story how this uh pilgrim he was he was habituated in stealing and he's gone to some temples already and so he was traveling with a group of people and because of that you know that samskara that was there in him he couldn't he couldn't control it he couldn't contain it so he said i pick in the bags of some of the coping games okay <laughs> and then in the morning the, the, the pilgrims they realized that where's my bag oh this on the other side oh, where's my bag oh it's on the other side so this guy was just trying to contain himself because he has a little bit of purity from the pilgrim uh, from from the pilgrimage but that sentiment of propensity to steal was still there so yeah when we get involved in some spiritual culture uh we may have some sentiments of our bad habits but with consistent practice we become purified of all of that So let's uh, conclude this on this spirited and positive note. Okay. We'll get into more interesting topics later on. Okay. But for the time being, it it has been wonderful talking to you. Fascinating, actually, absolutely fascinating. I'm sure we'll have you on many occasions to talk about many other interesting subjects and issues facing the world at large. A pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.